taught me while I was in residency, Dr. David Michalik. Hi, Dr. Michalik, thank you for being here. Hi, I'm Dr. Gonna, Alicia. I'm gonna let people know a little bit about your background and then we are today we're gonna talk about what we know right now currently about COVID-19 and pediatric cases. So we would love to have um, questions from the public, which we will get to as we go through our main five points. Dr. David Michalik is a pediatric infectious disease specialist locally in Orange County and South LA. He's an associate clinical professor and associate program director of the pediatric residency program at the University of California at Irvine School of Medicine. Beyond his teaching, he's actively engaged in clinical research projects involving viral infections. I was actually fortunate enough to do a small research project with him on meningitis and appreciate him as a mentor for all for all the bedside uh, bedside research and um, academics. You can read more about his numerous degrees and passions at um, when you look him up at under Dr. David Michalik. Welcome. So, Thank you very much for having me. Anything that you want to share with us about your background? I know you love backpacking and surfing and getting outside. Anything I missed about your background? No, I, I think you got it pretty much. I think you and I have known each other for quite a long time, and it's certainly a pleasure to uh, have the opportunity to talk to you and uh, your audience, as well as your patients and anyone else, um, about some things that I think we're both passionate about. Um, I would probably just add that I certainly enjoy teaching uh, developing physicians uh, like you once were, like we all once were, uh, and I get a lot of pleasure in, in doing that. So I've been fortunate enough to work with a lot of trainees over the years, and uh, I'm glad to see my trainees develop into competent, the fantastic pediatricians like yourself. So. Well, this is probably my most challenging talk because it's current and you have to stay on top of what we know and research and validate what we're reading. So for me, this is extremely exciting, but challenging. And I, I'm sure that's your day-to-day -day reality. Um, infections are constantly changing. Treatments are constantly changing. So I'm glad to lean on you on this one. But um, leading up to this, I was doing as much reading as I could to see where we're at with COVID-19 and pediatric vaccines. Let's start with our first question about what we know about local variants, the B117, the B1351, and the P1. These were things that I was told in my AP chapter chats are, have been tracked since December, and I don't think the public is aware. What do you know about our local variants? Well, when we look at variants in general, uh, it's something that's really not in not unexpected at all when it comes to any kind of infection from any microorganism. Certainly we see this in lots of other viruses out there, the most notable, notable one being influenza. Uh, and so when viruses come together in a host, they have the opportunity to rearrange and um, share genetic information or when they're challenged with uh, uh, a, an antiviral or an antimicrobial, they have the opportunity to um, develop resistance over, I guess you can call it evolution. So this coronavirus uh, pandemic has been a really uh, expert um, short kind of um, instruction for most people in learning about how viruses really work with human hosts. And so it seems natural that uh, coronavirus would evolve to change over time, and that depends on a lot of the factors I just mentioned. So we're starting to see a lot of these variants pop up in various parts of the world, like Brazil and South America and the United Kingdom, even here in California. So the CDC has done a really fantastic job uh, in tracking these, albeit their job can only track a very small percentage of all the circulating viruses that are in any given community. So uh, what we are seeing locally is that over half of all the variants here in the United States and in California are the United Kingdom or the UK variant that at this point many people in your audience may have heard about uh, there is these numbers seem to be rising and we're also seeing this with the variant that's coming out of Brazil and also the uh, uh, the South African variant 
There is there are two variants that are termed California variants, and those are small but not insignificant variants that are uh, starting to show up and increase in larger numbers. Uh, and the CDC and the California Health Department release information almost on a weekly basis to track um, how many of the viruses that they're analyzing actually are these variants. This seems to be important for a lot of reasons in terms of just discussing how much, how much more infectable these viruses are. And that's kind of what most people are concerned about, which is these variants seem to be more likely or easier transmitted from one person to another. And uh, that is probably the biggest factor. The second factor that we look at is how good is our vac how good are our vaccines and how good are our uh, medications that we have to fight coronavirus? Um, how active are they against these variants? And uh, we know that uh, uh, for the most part, vac the vaccinations that are out there, so the three that are licensed here in the United States, do have good protection against the variants, although at different percentages. So the mRNA vaccines, which is the Pfizer and the Moderna, uh, uh, have effectiveness against these variants, although not as much as some of the the, the more common variants that initially we were presented with. The the J the Johnson and Johnson vaccine is still being analyzed um, as to its effectiveness against the, these variants. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but I understand the last couple of weeks we've come out with peer review literature on the real life data on the vaccines and the variants. So if you look, if you, sorry, if you look at Israel and you look at Qatar, there have been mass vaccine, um, what's the word? They've been doing some mass vaccinations and retro, retrospective um, review. We see that by the time they were done with their trials, there was maybe up to 40 to 80 percent variance in those countries and still almost negligible hospitalizations with people who were vaccinated. So I understand that we're actually super excited about that. And from what I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, we see lots of ver lots of mutation in viruses that are usually a little more aggressive than the coronavirus. So this variation rate is not um, unnerving to an epidemiologist or an infectious disease doctor, correct? Well, I think what you're hearing a lot from public health officials and people in kind of my camp and a lot of physicians like yourselves is that these vaccines that we're uh, that are out there are actually performing uh, so much better than we ever expected. Uh, we have what's called the initial studies that get done when a, vice, a vaccine or any medication is licensed. Uh, and that's kind of the initial data that we had heard with the mRNA vaccines being 95% effective and the, the Johnson & Johnson being about 75% effective. And that's fantastic. But then now we need to see how these vaccines perform in the real world, meaning after the uh, initial approval uh, or the emergency youth authorization from the CDC. So these communities like Israel, like Qatar, uh, some uh, skilled nursing facilities and, and, and amongst healthcare workers, we're starting to see this data emerge showing that amongst people that have been vaccinated, we're really not seeing any severe disease at all. Uh, it doesn't mean that there aren't breakthrough infections. They still do occur, although the individuals that do get coronavirus after having been vaccinated usually have a very mild form of, of coronavirus, much less than what we potentially could see. Uh, and that's been really exciting and reassuring uh, amongst all the vaccines. So, so uh, we continue to remain optimistic, even with the vari variants that are in these communities. Uh, we want to see how they perform, how the vaccines perform against the variants, and we're seeing that they're actually doing very well. And it sounds like if we look at our local numbers, we're seeing the same thing here, because we know the variants have been here since, um, you know, early this year, even um, end of last year. In, in significant numbers. So we're not seeing an increase in hospitalization. So they may be more transmissible, but we're balancing that out with our vaccination most likely. And it's it's all looking pretty positive, right? 
Yeah, we've had uh, now, I think, for the third or fourth week uh, in a row, a significant drop in coronavirus ca cases across the nation, particularly in California. We're now at numbers that we haven't seen since last September, and uh, that's incredibly great. We're obviously seeing the uh, the level of alert, the alert level that the health officials have put out and being dropped down to uh, the, the level of yellow in Los Angeles County. Uh, the expectation or the hope is that we can essentially have uh, no alert level by the summertime. Uh, we'll have to wait and see how things go. Um, and so it's, it's fantastic, but as you, mm -hmm probably also have read that amongst the proportion of people that are coming up positive, the greatest number of positives seem to be between the 18 and low 30s age group, uh, with a significant piece of the pie being in now children under 18 years of age. I think we've all heard this number, 22% amongst pediatric patients. That just goes to show that we've had a lot of success with vaccination in the adult group, so it just makes sense that by this point in time, the population that hasn't been vaccinated, specifically children, you're going to see an increase in the number of those cases. It doesn't mean that the virus has become more infected, infectable. Uh, it just means that they haven't been vaccinated yet, so they still remain susceptible. So perfect. That brings us to our next question about why should children get vaccinated. But I want to add one quick comment that this last week or two, there was a study that New York Times posted, and it was a survey, and it found that a significant amount of Republicans were much more apt to get vaccinated after learning that it would allow um, things to open up. We see in Europe, they're doing a much better job about campaigning, about, about opening up and vaccinated people being able to host other vaccinated people and be with other children who aren't unvaccinated. And we're being a little more cautious here in the US, we want to see the data, but it's really exciting to know that maybe moving forward, if our data does prove this point that we might get more people to um, get vaccinated if they, if they know that they are now truly proven to be low risk for transmitting to their, to their families. So why would children get vaccinated? We don't see them, um, the death rate is pretty low why, why, what would you comment to parents if they ask, why should I get my child vaccinated? They're not at severe risk. So there's several reasons. Uh, I think number one, even though the number of children who are hospitalized because of coronavirus infection remain low, that number isn't zero. And so even if you talk to official or to physicians like myself who work in children's hospitals, when we had the surge back in, during the, the winter months, uh, we all saw several patients that were admitted to the hospital, either in the general pediatric floor or intensive care unit, who actually had acute COVID infection. A lot of these uh, children did have other significant risk factors that would put them at higher risk of getting uh, the kind of COVID infection that we hear about occurring more commonly in adults. Uh, in addition to that, what we did see a huge, large amounts of is this multi-organ inflammatory syndrome in children, or as health professionals like to call it, MISC. Uh, and that is this delayed inflammatory response that happens in children who get coronavirus infections. They get infected albeit maybe asymptomatically or with mild symptoms, and then anywhere from two to six weeks after their infection, they suddenly come down with an acute febrile illness, oftentimes uh, accompanied by headaches and abdominal pain. And it's very alarming and concerning to parents who have a child who essentially deteriorates very quickly. These children do end up going to see their primary care physician like yourself or get sent to an urgent care and emergency room. And a lot of these kids, if not all of them, essentially get admitted for treatments that get done. And so that, those two things, I think, need to be taken into account. And if you talk to any parent of a child who's experienced the acute COVID infection or the MISC, 
you'll mm -hmm. you'll probably hear that they they wish that they never had had to go through that. It's obviously a very difficult experience. So children are still not immune to getting coronavirus infections, albeit the numbers are low. The second reason I think is kind of more of a public health reason, and that is. Um, if children remain the group of people in a population who are not vaccinated, they may carry the virus, albeit maybe asymptomatically or mildly symptomatic, and still potentially become this reservoir of the virus that can then infect other people like adults or other children who may be at higher risk or who aren't able to uh, get the vaccine for a various number of reasons. So we really want to hopefully eliminate the, the reservoir, so to speak. And then the last kind of thing to remember is that if children carry the virus, there's, and as long as the virus remains in a certain group of the population, the virus then has the opportunity to continue to uh, mutate uh, and, and become a source of more variants. Right now we're hearing a lot about the, the cases in India and how bad things are there. There are triple mutation variants occurring over in India right now, and we don't really know what that means as far as in infectability and uh, uh, and such. But but as long as there is a reservoir infection in the world, places like Africa where only 1% of the population is vaccinated, I think we, we really need to, as public health officials, um, encourage everyone who can be vaccinated to get vaccinated. So if you talk to physicians like myself, we're always going to say it's a it's a good idea as long as it's safe. Now to get to your other question, which is kind of vaccine um, hesitancy, I guess if you want to call it, or even vaccine resistance, that seems like a very natural type of a response for parents who are want the best for their children and are uh, there's, you're going to find a group of people who look at what's going on with coronavirus. They definitely want their children to get vaccinated. There's going to be a also sizable group of parents who are curious about the vaccine, but feel like that maybe the vaccine was created too fast. Maybe we need some more information on the vaccine before I choose to have my children vaccinated. And then, of course, there's also a group of individuals, uh, uh, parents out there who just absolutely do not want to vaccinate their children. And I think, you know, it's it's normal, I think, a normal response to have, uh, to think about how, what you want for your children, what's best for your children. Uh, it's an opportunity to um, discuss, parents to discuss vaccines with their children overall, why they're necessary not just with coronavirus vaccine, but things like HPV vaccine or influenza vaccine or some of these other vaccines that uh, sometimes um, are not viewed on as favorably maybe by some people. I also think that we as health officials have a lot of work to do with some of the, uh, the minorities uh, and uh, uh, kind of uh, the, the healthcare disparities that we have specifically amongst African-American and and Latinx communities where the hesitancy or even the resistance to vaccines might be uh, higher. Uh, and I think we have an opportunity uh, as primary care physicians and a specialist to engage the community to, to talk about why vaccination is important. Like you said, the messaging that's happening in other parts of the country like Europe, which is if we all get vaccinated, we're that much more closer to being able to open up uh, the, our communities in, in a way that is hopefully as close to pre-COVID time as possible. Uh, although there's a lot of chatter with, it's gonna take a lot more effort with people getting vaccinated uh, to achieve that kind of herd immunity that uh, essentially we need so that those individuals who've been vaccinated or who have some protection after having gotten coronavirus itself uh, to be protected long enough to where the, those individuals in the community who can't be vaccinated um, are, are have some protection because their peers and their other people in the community are vaccinated. Uh, we'll have to wait and see how, how things go there. But I think we as physicians, we're all very excited about the, the uh, vaccine being made available to the 12 to 15 year group uh, with that study that just there's a small study that just that came out several weeks ago about 
the Pfizer vaccine in that 12 to 15 year age group. The numbers in that study were a lot less than the study that was done uh, to license the vaccine or to get that emergency use, use um, authorization uh, in adults. The numbers were a lot less, but what we essentially saw in that group, age group, was that the vaccine that's given as the same dose as is given in adults had the same side effect profile as we saw in adults, largely arm pain, potentially for a mild fever, headache, uh, a little bit of feeling of some chills possibly in a small group of those individuals who got the vaccine. Uh, and the thing that I think is very exciting is that that was also uh, mentioned in that study was that the uh, effectiveness of the vaccine in that group was 100%. And so that's that's fantastic. That just shows that uh, the children that uh, those children had a really robust immune response to to that vaccine. Um, Pfizer currently, Pfizer as well as some of the other uh, vaccine manufacturers are currently looking at their vaccines in the younger age groups as well. And uh, uh, there's an expectation, I think, that we're also going to see vaccine be being made available to children as young as two by late summer, but we'll wait and see how that goes. Just to follow up on some of the things you commented on for the public's knowledge, these original clinical studies went a step beyond some of our previous immune studies in that they were tracking CD4 T helper cells. And that's a much better indication of immunity versus our cheaper test of antibodies, which we see available. Everyone can check their antibodies you know, two, two to four weeks after their second vaccine. So we do know also, like you mentioned, that these um, younger individuals are getting a much more robust immune response, which we couldn't even want or expect or hope for because we have such a good response, better than any vaccine in our history um, to date with the immune response. And in the 1918 influenza um, pandemic, there were, we have studies where 90 years later, you can actually still see the human response and the serum of people who are, yes, 100 years old or 100 plus, they can still mount an immune response to that flu. So if our variants, um, we understand the variants have maybe 52 different locations on the spike protein that either we hope the vaccine produces the same response to, but real infection response produces a response to, we're going to see that that might last. And we don't even know, you know, the role of boosters at this time. But with the pediatric cases that you were saying, there's only um, very small numbers. We're so quickly doing retrospective peer review studies or real life data that we, for those who are a little hesitant, which we cannot blame, they'll get numbers, you know, here in about six months of is this side effect profile really the same or is there is there anything we're missing as far as adverse events we're just our eye is so closely on the ball that i don't think we're going to miss anything and we're going to have those larger numbers of um pediatric vaccine vaccinees and following them so i think this is all just wonderful great news that we've moved so fast even though the numbers are small for those who are comfortable they can move forward and then we can watch and see what happens correct yeah uh yeah you there, there's a lot of a lot of things there i mean if we 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 man we we measure antibodies as a surrogate for immune protection right uh, everybody seems to be getting blood work done to determine what their titer is after vaccines and what titer is the cutoff of protection versus not protection. And I think that the message here is that there's a lot of wheels in motion in our immune system that come into play when we are exposed to something or when we get a vaccine, right? It's not just antibodies that our body produces, but there's also other cells in our body that are important in protecting ourselves against infection. And so the, the lymphocytes that you talk about, which uh, uh, are, can be measured with, with C, as CD4 or CD8 or CD3, um, play an important role. And we're able to study 
that part of the immune response in uh, in some of the vaccine licensing studies that were done. And what we're seeing is that a lot of uh, individuals have really good responses from that part of their immune system, right? The, the cell mediated immunity, in addition to the antibodies that they respond to as well. So uh, even with the variants that are out there, uh, it, we, we still are, our bodies and our immune systems are complex enough to be able to um, protect ourselves from some of, some of these variants ideally maybe all, but I think we're going to have to wait and see how that goes. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Because we have a complex immune system that uh, that um, has amounted antibodies against more than just the, the variants that we see or against one particular type of, of COVID vaccination. But I think we'd love to see younger people be vaccinated, but it remains this evolving kind of uh, dynamic you mentioned at the beginning when you introduced me that uh, the data with coronavirus changes on a on a day to day, if not week to week basis, and that's entirely true. It certainly has been a full time job in and of itself, trying to keep up with the literature uh, and and learning uh, about enough data to give intelligent answers to people like yourself and your audience. Uh, and so I think when it comes to vaccinating children. The initial data seems very good. It's very reassuring. Uh, it will probably be given the emergency use, uh, use authorization from the FDA probably by Wednesday of this week for just the Pfizer vaccine. The other two vaccines currently in the United States will probably also be available to younger uh, ages in the future. Uh, and we're gonna have to see, just like we're seeing with uh, vaccinations, um, the, the post licensure studies um, in adults, we're going to see that in children as well. How are they going to do at summer camps? How are they going to do with sports? How are they going to do with schools? All those kinds of things. And rest assured, the everyone that's involved in, in analyzing this is really going to look at the data behind, uh, you know, side effects and 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 what what if any um, effects can occur that would make the vaccine um, be less uh, attractive to to uh, children uh, and even to adults for that matter you know we saw the the uh, the, the clots that can potentially occur with uh, the johnson johnson vaccine i was seen in, in the adults uh, and i think while certainly that needs to be tracked and looked at and when that was done for over a period of a week from the FDA, uh, things like that are really important uh, to track to, so that we can make sure that if we're going to recommend this, that it is safe and that we look for any effects that would be harmful. In my practice, I've seen a few breakthrough people vaccinated, exposed breakthrough cases, and I, you know, I, I get shocked. Oh, no. But we're seeing that they are, the studies show that those people are not transmitting like we once were fearful of. There's shedding of IgG and IgA in large amounts in the nasal mucosa. And people even with asymptomatic infection have shown to have the perfect um, response by the CD4 cells. So I think, I think we're, I, I'm just so optimistic after listening to some of the um, the more recent data come out and I'm excited. You mentioned um, tracking and I want everyone to know that Orange County and I'll post the website, it has been tracking the school, every school in Orange County has to report. And in the last couple of weeks, the total number of school cases has been under 50. In, a, in the winter, you know, we were under 500, but now we're under 50, which is great. And we're headed into the summer. It really does seem likely that if you're a parent and you get vaccinated, you'll be able to be with multiple kids. We're not saying that right now, but your cocoon could be multiple kids and you won't transmit from one child to the next, which we still have to confirm, but that's what some um, preliminary studies are showing. So yeah, getting children vaccinated, I think will become more comfortable as time go moves quickly here, quickly forward through the summer. And it's so exciting. Thanks for sharing that Wednesday is the day. We have some colleagues who have enrolled their children in these studies. And I think it's important for the public to hear that 
physicians are excited to put their kids in these studies. We trust, um, you know, everyone has children making these vaccines and enrolling their children in these vaccines. There's no, there's no, um, what's the, what's the word that everyone's, the people who are skeptic, they think that there's a, so. Like a controversy or like a conspiracy? There's no conspiracy. These are, you know, these are parents who are working on, in the science labs and making sure that everything's safe. So I think people have to think about it that way too. So let me move to the next question. Um, unless there's anything more you want to say about children. Oh, one last thing for children, it's the social implication. If they are sick, missing school, missing sports, um, being sent home, then the family, ha we still, everyone has to take off from work. So there, there is that. And of course the vaccines we usually get vaccinated for in schools have a much higher risk of death, but we are, if you compare the mortality last year to COVID versus measles and some of these other vaccine preventable diseases, that the number was higher. So it still is worthwhile and may not be mandated, but it's important for society. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's an important point to look at the psychological impact that this pandemic has had on our youth, right? Um, being stuck at home, not having the interaction with their peers, not having interaction with socialization. Uh, it's really taken its toll. We, we, you know, we as adults know what impact it's had on ourselves, but it's been huge on on the youth uh, across the world. Uh, and I think the closer we can get to opening things up for uh, children and teenagers, uh, that will, that has a big impact. And I think with vaccination, yeah. we'll be one step closer uh, to that. I think my, my psychology and psychiatry colleagues um, have really been documenting and, and, and really raising the alarm about um, how mental health uh, has really deteriorated in, in a large number of children. Uh, and it, I see it in my practice uh, amongst adults and in children that I, that I see, uh, it, it's really huge. So uh, getting kids back to a school setting, opening things up in that regard, I think is, a, is certainly very important to, to address. And so that's another reason to feel safer. Families, I think parents might feel safer sending their kids to school or camp or sporting events if they've been vaccinated. You know, I think uh, that is a valid- I think it's gonna come uh, down to the, the risk reward and how other nations are framing it. We can open up, the school can be back to normal. Once we get 70% of the kids vaccinated, it's just done. Herd immunity, of course, is not for the people who are vaccinated, but rather for those who just can't for their own, for whatever medical reasons they cannot. And for right now, the herd immunity is to protect our children because they aren't the ones getting vaccinated. So the risk reward is definitely a reason to to consider vaccination. If you if we can give the kids a green light to go back to normal as soon as you know they're they've built their immune response to the vaccine, then that's huge. That's just for them. That's the biggest reward there is to getting vaccinated. So. Yeah. I, I I think uh, it's important to note, you know, again, we're still in the process of collecting data. The recommendation isn't there yet, um, but it will be probably this week. Um, the vaccine is available. The Pfizer vaccine, only the Pfizer vaccine is available for 16 and older. So for any of your uh, audience who uh, is interested in getting their 16, 17 year olds vaccinated, uh, that is available 18 and older for Johnson and Johnson and, and Moderna. Uh, but being mindful, you mentioned about breakthrough infections that uh, at least in the adult studies, uh, just because you've been vaccinated doesn't mean that you can't get coronavirus um, completely. Um, again, it's still 95% effectiveness in some communities maybe more in some communities maybe less uh, but it's not a hundred percent so uh, there still is recommendations for uh, wearing a mask hand hygiene keeping that social distance um, in place 
uh, even more so in, a, in an indoor setting. I think we're seeing a lot of the transmission occurring uh, in an indoor setting than an outdoor setting. Uh, granted, masking in young children uh, is something that uh, I think we can ease up on. And I know that there's, there's talk amongst the CDC about easing uh, masking in adults, uh, and we'll have to wait and see what they say in the upcoming weeks, um, given the fact that our numbers are declining across this country. Um, but it's really important still to to wear a mask uh, when you're out uh, and, and to continue to do that hand hygiene and distancing. Uh, and we'll see what and that that should also be the case, certainly in children who are um, returned to school. And then our next question is, how can one interpret the local case numbers? I don't know if this is as relevant anymore. The case you already spoke about this. Is there anything you want to add about how our, our numbers are dropping and continue to drop? Anything about local numbers that you think is relevant when people look? Well, I think I think it just shows that even though numbers are dropping, we still can't. We still should continue to have that uh, awareness, right? And and do the things that I mentioned. So now that you can go to just about any vaccine um, site in Orange County uh, and not have to wait in line, they don't, they're not taking appointments anymore for anybody who's 16 and older. If there's anybody on in your audience that hasn't been vaccinated to please uh, go ahead and get vaccinated. And if there uh, are any questions that remain about why you want to wait, to address those with your primary care physician, um, or if you're reading anything online that you're concerned about, uh, write those down and also address those with your primary care physician so that you can get the best data. The data keeps changing. We talked about that every week, uh, yet we should still remain vigilant. You know, school is ending uh, in the next uh, month or so for a lot of the, the children in Orange County. And we're looking at things like, you know, getting them on vac vacation and and, and uh, camps and all those things, which uh, I think we all want for our kids, but we want to do so safely. So what does it look like? What does COVID look like um, when you're flying? What does it look like when you're playing, let's say, sports, uh, indoor versus outdoor? And I, uh, I think you mentioned in... Uh, uh, previous um, settings, you know, going to the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, website and and finding some really well done discussions about some of these topics specifically, like COVID with sports activities, COVID with travel, um, that are made available to public uh, to listen to and get information from. And certainly, if there's any healthcare providers on your talk today, um, that would be a phenomenal resource to get those questions answered because things do change. What was what was the case a month ago may not be the case come summertime. And it's good to, to uh, try to get as much factual information as possible to be able to talk to your, your patients about. Um, but I remain really, uh, uh, I remain really optimistic that in the state of California, our numbers really have plummeted. And I still remain very um, sad to see uh, the the tragedy that has kind of unfolded in places like India and some of the uh, other uh, uh, developing nations. Um, it really goes to show uh, how uh, awareness and access to uh, healthcare, access to vaccinations, etc., um, how it leaves a lot of communities uh, with not many options, and it's really been a, a total tragedy. And I think we all can. Uh, agree that that's not something we want to see happen anywhere in the world, let alone in our community. So it's reassuring that we're doing better. We still have some work to do. The virus isn't going away anytime soon, but we still need to uh, to, to keep at it. And um, and hopefully vaccination will will continue to to uh, uh, to make a dent in the numbers. Great, great. Yeah, I I keep tracking the numbers, and they seem to stay low and. To me, we we're still masking, and that's it, it feels. So we'll have to see what happens if um, things change. So we'll we'll keep an eye on it. I sent I added the link in the talk under the comments, so for people who want to see where we are today, no deaths, and um, the death toll in Orange County has been around five thousand total. So when will we back to when will we be back to normal, and how do we get there? Is that a question you feel like you could even talk 
on. I, I think it's a heavy, heavy one, loaded yeah, it's one. A, but. It's certainly a very, very, very interesting and, and, and potentially changing answer. Um, if, if we're talking about back to normal, meaning, uh, you know, pre-COVID, it seems like uh, it's going to be quite a bit of time before that occurs. I am starting to hear chatter amongst my colleagues uh, in the public health arena and the infectious disease arena about the likelihood of whether coronavirus is ever going to go away, meaning the current coronavirus forms. Coronavirus has been with us for you know, centuries, but this particular version of coronavirus, uh, or is it going to become something like um, influenza, where we're going to have to have a booster every year. <clears throat> I think because uh, there's no mandates for vaccination at this time, although that, there's chatter about that with in certain communities and certain types of um, private um, settings, um, it's coronavirus will still play a role for years to come. So when you have symptoms, of fever and a sore throat or some of the more common manifestations of COVID. We're probably, as doctors, going to be checking for COVID-19 uh, like we would, let's say, for influenza or rhinovirus. Uh, and I think that's going to be the case for a long time. And when these, these, these positive cases come up, we will have more information about what we can do to treat that particular type of uh, uh, virus. Um, but as far as back to normal, We've all been adapting to coronavirus over the last year in, in various ways, um, and it's still an evolving story. Again, I'm I'm optimistic about the numbers dropping, but when we look at what's happening in other places in the world uh, where the virus is just getting started, uh, we as as with globalization, right? We're, we're traveling, we're moving, we're. Uh, we're, we're not in our little silos anymore. Uh, I think coronavirus, COVID-19 is going to be around for a long time. Now, whether what that's going to look like, meaning whether we're going to need to be wearing masks every winter or not, I think uh, we're going to find that there's going to be a certain group of people that will be wearing masks. Maybe there will even be uh, public health mask mandates that might come back again. Uh, when the numbers start to go up again, or even if they go up again, um, maybe mask wearing with flying or being in closed quarters. Those are all interesting questions that I think we don't have black and white answers to. I think if you and your audience is concerned about getting a viral infection of any sort, you know, then uh, um, certain protections can be helpful in preventing or mitigating that. But because we're not going to really get we really want to get 100% of the population uh, vaccinated uh, like we did with smallpox many, many years ago, where we can really say we've eradicated the virus from the face of the earth. Uh, whether we're going to get to that point, I think, is um, going to be very challenging. We look and see what has happened with things like measles or polio, right, which are these uh, viruses that uh, many people who are above a certain age remember very well. Uh, we know that, uh, and now with things with measles making a resurgence, right? Uh, it just takes a small group of people that are not protected against the virus to show how easy a virus can be transmitted from person to person. Now, if measles is different than coronavirus, uh, which is different than polio, and so there's different discussions that can be had with each one of those viruses. But as far as COVID-19 goes, we as healthcare professionals feel that it's not the benign virus that some people think it is. It still remains very dangerous and sometimes even deadly, even in, uh, in the pediatric setting. And so we still want to really do, the, do our best to protect ourselves and our families from getting this infection. Uh, it's not just benign. Uh, and so we're going to have to deal with this uh, for quite some time before we can consider things to be, you know, back to normal. Well, I was definitely, <laughs> definitely hoping for a more optimistic vantage point, but we just, it seems like we're just not there yet. I listened to some of these talks about the vaccine and I 
feel like we're we're right around the corner. Uh, if everyone gets vaccinated, of course you have to be safe, but it sounds like I and there, I don't think there's much expect, expectation for eradication. But since this isn't going to mutate as much as influenza, there is maybe a chance if we get well vaccinated that the studies that we're seeing now are real. We might have um, great drops. And, uh, you know, that we see certain states where they actually are not masking and they're going to be our little case studies and even local local pockets where people are not masking and not vaccinating. So time will tell, time will tell. So your word is be cautious, keep your mask on, wait to see what happens. Yeah, uh, you know, another thing that's important too is, is as kind of as a reminder, and I think a lot of people in the healthcare field have seen uh, so many other uh, health conditions occur alongside COVID. I think COVID has kind of co occupied all of our minds for such a long time uh, in terms of how, what it's doing physically to, to people and even mentally to people, uh, people's mental health. But we think about all these other conditions that people have. And I think there's a lot of fear that families have had over the last year about going to seek medical care for things like asthma or inflammatory bowel disease or diabetes uh, and maybe even dental health, something as basic as getting their teeth cleaned. And uh, I think what I really want to impart as well as a message to the listeners is how important it is for uh, families, adults, and children to re-engage in care for those things that might have kind of been put by the side as people or as we're dealing with coronavirus, right? And so to go back to your primary care physician to get those vaccines that are now delayed, to uh, seek care from the endocrinologist for the diabetes that someone might have, to look at things like um, obesity in children or even in adults for that matter, uh, particularly in the last year as we've been at home and, and maybe uh, uh, we haven't had the active lifestyle that we once had, uh, to certainly make sure that you re-engage in care to continue to do those health maintenance things, right? Uh, to stay healthy. Uh, uh, so since coronavirus isn't going away anytime soon, the waiting game for other things is, should no longer be happening. We should we should be accessing care on a preventative basis uh, to uh, to keep ourselves healthy. That brings us to our last comment. Uh, our last question is: What are you seeing as the main pediatric infection risk for COVID? Is it asthma plus something else like obesity? Is it more obesity or? Um, type 2 diabetes in older children? And have you been seeing these long-term complications? I've seen some anxiety after, some anxiety disorders after having COVID in kids. Are you seeing anything specific? So we've seen cases of active COVID in all the risk factors that you describe, uh, particularly with obesity, seems to be more common. Uh, we've had some patients who have also struggled with um, obesity come to the hospital with active COVID. Um, I think what has also emerged, not as a specific individual risk factor, but kind of more of a family dynamic risk factor, is just being in close quarters with one another. Uh, up here in, in Long Beach, we have a, a larger Latin uh, X population and um, we find a lot of uh, positive cases in within families because they're gathering uh, in family activities in larger groups. And uh, that was certainly much more the case when the virus was surging, uh, particularly also holidays, et cetera. So people getting together in uh, closed quarters is where what seemed to be a common trait amongst the the, the pediatric patients that were admitted to the hospital. And I'm sure that's even just on the surface with uh, cases that just had to go to the emergency room, you know. We've also First seen, interestingly, uh, a few cases of patients who uh, had a psychiatric diagnosis uh, who developed COVID as well. Now, whether that was because um, 
uh, of the specific features. Um, I can't really say that there's one thing that necessarily stands out, but that for some reason was a more common um, type of a patient, I guess, that we would see more often in the hospital. Correct, and I think there's some of the kids I was seeing with anxiety had a mild anxiety prior. Sorry, there's an echo here. Some some sort of mild mental health issues in the family that were exacerbated when they got sick. As far as um, severe cases in pediatrics, which are still pretty darn rare, we're talking about the same risk factors that we see in adults with obesity, lung prior lung disease, prior heart conditions. Is that anything else that sticks out for you? Yeah, you know, pretty much those. Uh, immune compromise uh, as well for, for various reasons. Um, so pan patients with cancer uh, or who are taking medication to suppress their immune system for uh, a variety of reasons, um, that also was something that had us very worried when a patient would get coronavirus who had those that kind of a background. And do you have any recommended treatments other than over-the-counter vitamin C, zinc, fluids, rest? There's so many things that come up to the primary care physician about what, what they want to try. Quercetin's been something in in um, supplements. And wondering if you, if you have any specific directions for patients once they're diagnosed. Yeah, it's not an uncommon question uh, at this point. There's really no recommendation to give any supplementation to a pediatric patient at all. Um, there's been a lot of things out there that have been discussed as far as um, prophylaxing against getting COVID or if you get exposed, take X, Y, or Z. And within the pediatric setting specifically, no recommendation to uh, take anything, even things like over-the-counter medication or vitamins or minerals or anything like that. And I would certainly caution against using those supplements unless there's a very specific reason that you've discussed with your primary care physician. Um, I think the basics that you've been hearing about since day one, which is, you know, regular hand hygiene and, and that mask wearing, not just, you know, below the nose, but properly worn masks and kind of that distance is are really the cornerstones of disease prevention when it comes to COVID, sticking to those things. And also what I would say is, is really, I kind of mentioned this before, as far as diet, uh, our diets have somehow for some individuals and some families kind of lost its way. And we've seen uh, things like uh, weight gain occur in families, uh, not just amongst adults, but also in children because of uh, maybe different access to food, inactivity, whatever reason. So it's really important to address that in the family dynamic, right? If there are underlying health conditions to readdress those health conditions with the primary care physician or a specialist and get yourselves back to your physical selves, back to where things were prior to, to COVID. So if, if, if obesity is an issue, addressing 